Here is the story of poor old Jake. He never thought of a need to break, but he stopped at last as stop he must. So who needs breaks in which to trust? The distribution of power from your foot pressure to the brake drum follows an exciting little journey. First, the pedal to cross shaft rod moves to the front where it causes the service brake cross shaft to turn. At the end of the cross shaft, a double ended lever pulls both front and rear brake rods. The rear brake rod connects with a clevis pin to the rear brake lever which is attached to the rear brake camshaft. And the action here forces the cam into the rollers on the brake shoes, causing the shoes to expand with great pressure against the drum. Up at the front brakes, a similar action is taking place. The brake rod pulls a lever, which turns a shaft inside this shaft housing. The end of the shaft has a pawl which pushes downward on the push rod. And the end of the push rod does push against the front operating wedge, which forces itself into the rollers and doing the final job of stopping the wheel. So this is the way the system works. The object now is to make it work good, as good as it did 50 years ago. The primary job is to remove all of the looseness and play in the system caused by wear and neglect over the years. If we remove less than all of the play, we will have less than perfect breaks, and this really is no place for half measures. We must restore everything to original tolerances if we expect to have the kind of breaks a Model A could have, should have, and actually did have when it was new. Let's start with the brake pedal and the pedal shaft. Probably the pedal shaft will be worn, like this one. It should be replaced. Good reproductions are available. Also, the brake and clutch pedals should be rebushed. This can be done with a hammer and a bushing driver, but a small arbor press is nice. The pedals with new bushings should fit tight on the shaft. Next in line is the rod between the pedal and the brake cross shaft. This is a short rod with a hole near one end and a clevis on the other. These holes and the clevis holes have probably been worn through the years. It's the same story with all the holes and clevis ends on the four service brake rods too. Altogether, there are five such holes five clevis ends and six levers, all of which will probably need to have the play removed from them, unless you're lucky enough to be working with a very low mileage Model A. One good method is to braze all of the holes shut, then drill them out to size and dress the excess brass from the sides. It's a nice idea to drill the holes slightly undersized and then ream the rods and the levers together for a close fit with no binding. Another, easier method can be used, especially if the parts are not worn to excess. This is just a matter of drilling out all the holes oversized and using oversized clevis pins which are available. It doesn't matter too much how we do it so long as we effectively eliminate play everywhere. Excessive play is cumulative. Add a tiny bit here, plus a little bit in another place or two, and soon our brakes become spongy and ineffective. By the way, if you're using reproduction brake rods, you'll likely find that the ends are too wide to fit into the levers. The solution here is to grind a little off of the rod until you get a nice fit. So much for the rods and the levers. Let's talk about the service brake cross shaft. Almost all unrestored cross shafts will have wear and unwanted play at the bearing ends. The cure is to renew the shaft ends to the original size and replace the worn bearings. Now this is a machine shop job and unless equipped, the average restorer will probably send this work out. It's a simple operation for a machine shop. The shaft ends are built up with weld and then turned down to fit the lever. Generally, 
The biggest part of the job here is removal of the double-ended levers from the ends of the shaft. Grind off the head of the rivet, and if you're very lucky, you can drive out the rivet with a punch. But usually, the rivets are very tight and require drilling out. Once the job is done, the shaft end should look like this and provide a nice fit for the bearing with no excessive play. Original bearings had a special brass impregnated composition lining on the inside. They were excellent, but most all of them have long since been completely worn out. Several replacements are available. Here's one with a web lining on the inside. Aluminum bearings have shown up from time to time, but I don't recommend them. Too many people have discovered that they can seize on the shaft. Now here is a brass bushing cut in half to provide two shells which can be fitted to the end of the shaft without removing the levers, which usually is only half a fix. For if the bearings are worn, the shaft end most likely is to be worn also. The solid brass replacements are probably the most serviceable of all. After painting to your liking, Reinstall the restored cross shaft on the frame using the original clamps, if good, or some better originals which you might find at a swap meet. Or if in desperate need, you can use reproduction clamps. Put grease on both the inner and outer surface of the bushings. Next in line is the complete brake assembly, all attached to the backing plate. And the backing plate itself requires some attention. By the way, this is the right time to examine the end of the axle housing and the machined bearing surface for the rear brake drum. If this bearing surface is excessively worn or has a flat spot on the bottom, then the drum will not turn true to center and it will be impossible to secure a brake adjustment. Should you have this problem, the only cure is another rear axle housing or a good machine shop can turn the diameter on the old bearing surface and install a sleeve to restore it to the original size. Take this opportunity to inspect the keyway at the end of the rear axle itself. It must not be worn or wallowed on the sides. The key must fit tight and firm. It is possible at a machine shop to repair a worn keyway by cutting it out oversized and then using a stepped or T-shaped key between the axle and the brake drum. A more likely fix, however, is to simply find a better original axle, or reproductions that we have seen are not usable. The most important part of the backing plate is the roller track. All four backing plates have this track, and the top surface must be perfectly smooth and straight. This is very important. Typically, a worn roller track will look like this, making rough sledding for the roller pin, a spongy pedal, and poor brakes. Reproduction roller tracks are available for the front backing plates if you wish to use them. But I have always preferred to build the top surface with a steel well and then on a milling machine or simply with a small do-more grinder and a file in your own garage, the surface can be dressed to exact size. We should, of course, maintain the correct height and position of the roller track relative to the studs. An easy way to do this is to put a heavy scribe mark even with the top of the tracks before building up the weld. Most all of the original wedges are quite good. If so, use them. But if badly worn or chewed up, get a replacement from Auto Hardware Supply in Bedford, Ohio. Their replacements function as well as the original. However, I would be extremely careful about other reproductions. Some are so bad they won't even fit the hole. With the backing plates restored, we are now ready to work on all the moving parts. And the first thing to move in this mechanism is the rear brake camshaft. Off the car, it looks like this. And once again, we have the sticky little problem of removing the lever. By grinding, punching, drilling, pulling, and gritting our teeth, once done, we can remove the camshaft. It probably will be worn like this one. We can either have the old shaft built up with weld and turn back to the original size, or we can replace with a new camshaft. If replacing with new, check the quality of the reproduction part. Some are just terrible. Others are quite good. 
Snyder's in New Springfield, Ohio, offers a very good one. Brass bushings for the camshaft are in this portion of the backing plate. Remove the old bushings, replace them with new bushings, and ream if necessary for a nice slip fit with no play. The next part in this sequence is the cam, the all-important cam itself, which will spread the shoes apart and force them into the brake drum for stopping the car. Most of the reproduction cams are so bad that you're better to do nothing at all in spite of the importance of this little part. Again, however, Snyder's Antique Parts in New Springfield, Ohio, recently started offering this reproduction part, which is quite good. Otherwise, an excellent choice is very carefully rework your old cams by hand. Most of the originals are restorable. With a little care, we can remove the burrs and the obvious wear spots without changing the contour of the cam. So the cam fits in the end of the camshaft, and when the lever is pulled, the cam forces itself into the rollers on the brake shoes. So this is next, the rollers and the roller pin. Rollers are not too much of a problem. They were hardened parts, and a big percentage of the originals are still good. Besides, reproduction rollers are prevalent, and some of them are quite good. But the roller pin is another story. It rides on the brake track, and therefore it should have a flat machined edge, and it should be perfectly round. Most of the originals are worn, both the head which rides on the roller track and the shank which pins the rollers to the brake shoe. They really should be replaced. And the reproductions, they are absolutely terrible. They are not machined. They are a swedged part which bears little resemblance to the original. Typically, they are out of round as much as 20 or 30 thousandths or more. If you think that one's bad, here's another repo with no dimension that is correct. The head, for instance, is over 50 thousandths undersized. Because it is so important to good action and because suitable reproductions presently are not available, these pins should really be machined at a good machine shop. Eight of these pins are required per car. They will not be cheap, but precision duplicates of the original pins will surely improve your brakes. Of course, if you make up your own roller pins or have them made, they will provide a good fit at the hardened rollers which don't seem to wear. The fit at the brake shoe may be good also, but some of these holes could be worn and may need the same treatment as the end of the brake rods for a good fit. By the way, the roller pin we've been talking about is the one which fits the cam end of the brake shoe. The pin at the other end of the shoe, the adjusting shaft end, is not so critical because the head does not ride on a track. It remains in a push position under spring pressure at all times. Reproduction pins generally are good enough for this end. The adjusting shaft itself. Fortunately, the original item has held up well through the years, and most of them can be refurbished as good as new by simply redressing the ends, being careful to maintain the original angle on the slopes, and keeping the tip surface centered and straight. This can be done with a file or a sander. When finished, round the tip surface slightly so it will ride in the adjusting wedge notches without cutting. Now it's time to install new linings on the brake shoes. Use only the soft woven high friction linings. The quality will vary from place to place. Just make sure it's a soft woven type, preferably the kind with the tiny brass hairs that are showing in the surface. Take the linings you have, Clean out the counterbore areas with this little tool which comes with a dandy inexpensive riveting set that's available at most antique auto supply houses. It's called a general riveting set number 824. Bend the lining around the shoe starting at the center and working toward each end. Use clamps to hold the lining against the shoe between the holes to prevent spaces along the way. Some people claim that soaking the lining in water overnight will soften it and help prevent cracking as it is formed to the curve of the shoe. After relining all eight brake shoes, chamfer the ends of the linings, which are almost always a high spot. Do this with a sander or a file. 
I recommend a deep chamfer reaching almost to the first rivet holes. By the way, if you must use old, original brake drums, which have been turned oversized, you may find it necessary to use a shim between the lining and the shoe. If this is the case, I strongly recommend an alternate. Either find better original drums or consider the new cast iron replacement drums, which are excellent. Most experts agree that original drums, which must be turned as much as 100 thousandths oversized, should be scrapped to prevent warping, brake heating, and fading, and also for your own safety. Enough about the brake lining for the moment. Let's set our eight shoes aside and get along with the rest of our mechanical restoration, namely the front brakes. It's much the same here as the rear brakes, but it's much, much easier. The backing plates are done the same, rebuilding the roller tracks and replacing the adjusting wedge if necessary. The first link in the chain is our front brake shaft. The shaft housing has a bushing at each end. Remove them. This homemade tool is handy for the job. Install new bushings and, if necessary, ream to the shaft size. The shafts are hard and they seem to have held up pretty well over the years. Many can be used the way you find them. If worn, however, either find a better shaft or have it built up with weld and turn back to size. Reproductions that we've seen are so poor they should not even be considered. When the brake lever is pulled, it turns the shaft and the pawl at the end of the shaft presses downward on this little push rod. It travels through the center of the kingpin forming the link between the shaft and the front brake operating wedge. It's such a simple little part, it would be hard to make one wrong, wouldn't it? Well, here's an original, and here's a reproduction. It looks nice, has the rounded balls on the end, and it's the right diameter. Only one problem, it's not the correct length. It will not work. The correct length is seven and three sixteenths of an inch. When restoring the brakes, it's a good time to replace the kingpin and bushings. Some kingpins are so poorly made that the shaft and housing won't even go in without binding. The front operating brake wedge, though different than the rear brake cam, is much the same story. It rides up and down on this special stud, which also secures the assembly to the backing plate. These special studs are almost always reusable. Use the best originals you can find and rework them carefully with mild cutting material to preserve the contour of the cam surface. That's about it for the mechanical restoration of our brake parts. The only thing left to talk about is the brake springs. There are good reproduction springs and there are very bad reproduction springs. To fit properly, the hooked ends of the short service brake springs should be at a 90 degree angle to each other. Here's a repo with the hooked ends equal to each other. Even if made of good material, which it probably is not, this spring will never work properly. We hate to keep mentioning it, but to give credit where credit is due, we find that Snyder Antique Auto Parts in New Springfield, Ohio offers excellent reproduction springs. There is nothing wrong with using original springs, so long as they are not stretched or excessively rusted. Just wire brush them, give them a coat of enamel, and most will be as good as new. We've restored all of the important mechanical parts of our brake system, and with only one important exception, we are ready to put on the brakes. Remember, we reline the brake shoes and we put them aside. These must now be fitted to our brake drums. One method of fitting the shoes to the drum can be done in your garage, but it's a long and tortuous routine, which I really hesitate to recommend but it goes like this. Have your brake drums turned at a brake shop, making sure they are never turned more than 100 thousandths oversized, preferably much less. Then completely assemble the brakes, all components and springs and shoes and the drum on one spindle at a time. Rub chalk or water-based paint over the linings, then while one person applies the brakes, you turn the wheel hard and harder to rub off the chalk on the high spots on the lining. Now disassemble the brakes and remove the shoes. Check for the high spots on the lining and with a file or a grinder, hone down the high spots. Put it all back together again. Turn the wheel some more and take the shoes off again. 
grind some more off the lining to get it better. You must keep on doing this until you feel you have a very high percentage of brake lining in contact with the brake drum. If you're lucky, you may get away with going through the process only two or three times, or then you could spend a whole day on one set of linings. The alternative is far simpler, less painful, and more exact. Most any city should have one or more good brake shops. This one is PM Auto Supply in Dallas, Texas. They do excellent brake work. Have your drums turned. Pick the best ones you can find. If they're not really good, then I highly recommend the new cast iron drums made by the Plasmeter Corporation in Albany, Oregon. They are excellent. Having turned the drums, a pair of brake shoes are dedicated to each drum and marked. Each pair of shoes are then ground on a special grinding machine which has been set to arc the shoes to match the exact contour of the turn drum at the same time that it grinds the high spots from the lining. Once done, this pair of brake shoes stays with the drum for which they were ground and are not to be commingled or mixed up with other shoes. Isn't that simple? It really is not very expensive and it will save a lot of trouble and hard work and will guarantee a perfect fit for the lining to the drum. Let's start the assembly with a rear backing plate. Replace the adjusting wedge in your backing plate with a good original or order a reproduction from Auto Hardware Supply. Grease it well. Screw it all the way in from the back side and replace the dust cover. Use special brake lubricant which doesn't run when it gets hot. It's available at any good auto supply store. Use this grease to lubricate all moving parts in the brake system. Install the camshaft with its dust ring and lever on the rear backing plate and make sure you use the left-hand lever on the left backing plate and the right-hand lever on the right backing plate. The clevis opening must be canted toward the center of the car. Include the little dust ring and secure the lever to the shaft with a new pin and then pin it over to secure it. With just the two forward backing plate bolts in place, turn the brake rod lever all the way forward and snake it through the open end of the radius rod while slipping it over the rear axle. Done in proper sequence, putting on the brakes can be done easily by hand, using only the necessary wrenches to tighten the backing plate bolts and some needle nose pliers for the cotter keys. Push the brake adjusting shaft on each shoe into the adjusting wedge housing, making sure the bevel of the link matches the bevel of the wedge. Attach the long brake spring to the adjusting shaft end of both brake shoes. Then add a short spring to the roller end of the lower shoe, attaching the short end of the spring to the stud which anchors it to the backing plate, the long end to the brake shoe. Now install the cam and the camshaft, making sure not to reverse it. It must expand the shoes when activated. The second shoe, with its short spring, is then forced into place, just as with the first shoe. Check the action here, pulling the lever by hand to make sure everything works properly. Once done, we can remove the temporary nuts from the two front bolts, install the emergency brake carrier and the grease baffle, then add the two rear backing plate bolts, all the nuts, tighten well, and then secure with cotter keys. We will presume that the emergency brake bands were relined when we relined the brake shoes. Also, we have checked the emergency brake shaft and the bushings in the carrier plate for wear. Replace the bushings if necessary. Amazingly, this shaft and even the bushings normally do not require replacing. The short links go together like this, not like this. 
Put together, they should form a continuous line. Assemble the emergency band with the linksman shaft off of the car. The three special thin head clevis pins are installed with the heads facing to the outside of the car with the cotter keys on the inside. The completed assembly is then installed on the emergency brake carrier. Just remember that there is a right hand assembly and a left hand assembly along with a right and left lever. Set the return spring over the shaft like this and making sure that we have the left hand lever and the left hand spring for the left hand brake, we fit it over the keyway. Push it or tap it fully into place and secure it with the bolt and the lock washer. Hooking the spring around the lever can be a sticky little job. With a screwdriver, a strong hand and patience, it can be juggled into place. This can be trying though for it almost always results in chipped and broken paint around the lever area. One neat trick is to tie strong cord or a length of wire around a screwdriver or a wrench or almost anything to form a handle and secure the other end of the wire to the crook of the spring. And then with a firm pull, you can pull the spring around the lever with little or no paint damage. Using the correct brake drum for the shoes installed, Lube the roller bearings, put a good square key in the rear axle keyway, and install the drum. If you find that the brake drum rubs against the backing plate or any of the brake shoes, you will need to use an axle shim to space the drum outward for clearance. Put a fiber washer over the axle and into the recess on the drum. Run the nut on to the threads and torque it heavily. It is important to make this a very tight fit. Now for the front brakes. They are done much the same way, only they're easier. That's why we've saved them for life. Install the backing plate and grease baffle on the spindle with four bolts and castellated nuts. Start the operating wedge and the stud into place, and at the same time, insert the push rod into the spindle. Let it drop back into the top of the operating wedge and secure with the castellated nut. Push the adjusting links into the adjusting wedge housing. Attach the long spring at the adjusting link end, then a short spring on one shoe, and we can force it into place. And the same thing with the other shoe. With everything in place, and the front brake operating wedge in its full up position, the push rod should provide a solid link between the shaft and the top of the wedge in such a manner that the front brake lever is in a forward attitude, about 15 degrees ahead of top center as the braking action starts. If this is not the case, if the lever will move to a 12 o'clock position before braking action starts, we can correct this condition by adding one or more little cup-shaped spacers called brake pills. These placed at the top of the front operating wedge will effectively force the lever forward where it belongs. Grease the bearings with wheel bearing grease. Install them with the correct drum and adjust for a tight but no load turning fit. By this time, we have restored and reinstalled all four of our brakes. We've done a considerable amount of work and have spent some good money, too. All of it, everything we have done, is absolutely worthless unless we perform the correct adjustment on the brake rods. Jack up all four wheels and check to see that the cross shaft is centralized with the double lever at each end straight up and down. Adjust each wheel with the adjusting wedge until you achieve a distinct drag. Then back off a notch or two. With rods attached to the rear brake levers, take up the free play only. And at the forward end of the rod, adjust the clevis so the pin will just go in. Leave the cotter pins out for the moment. Then, with the front brake rod attached to the cross shaft, 
Take up the free play only and adjust the clevis until the pin just slips in. With some assistance from a helper and some spacer blocks to put under the brake pedal, we can refine the adjustment of the rods. Another method is to simply mark a piece of masking tape with a ruler and stick it on the side of the brake pedal at the floorboard. We can then measure the amount of pedal movement. This procedure is defined on page 202 of the Ford Service Bulletins. When the pedal is depressed one inch, the rear brake should evidence a firm drag. And at one and one half inches, the rear brake should have a very heavy drag, but not locked. At two inches depression of the pedal, you should be unable to turn the rear wheels. If you have not achieved this, then either tighten or loosen the rods is necessary a little at a time until you get the proper adjustment. Do the front wheels the same way with different specifications. At one inch pedal depression, they should just begin to actuate. At one and a half inches, they should give you a firm drag. At two inches, the front brake should have a very heavy drag, but not locked up. Now, having adjusted all of the rods to produce the correct pressure on the front and rear wheels, you should be able to install the cotter keys, lock nuts, and button it up. All further adjustments, until the next time we need to rely on the brakes, should require only adjustment at the wedges. Now, that's what we're going to do now, the final driving test. We'll presume that the steering gear, the front end, kingpins, and all the other parts that may affect the brakes are in good condition. You should be able to handle a panic stop with at least two inches of space left between the pedal and the floorboard. If we can achieve this, then our brakes are right. If not, then perhaps we will need to tighten and adjust all four wheels. The rear brakes should be equal in our effort also. If one is stronger than the other, if it produces a heavier imprint on the pavement, then we can either loosen the adjusting wedge by a notch or two or tighten the opposite wheel by a notch or two. The front brakes also should be equal in their effort to stop. If the car pulls to one side in a sudden stop, we'll loosen the adjusting on that side by a notch or two. Or we'll tighten the opposite side. After we have equalized the front and rear brakes in our road test, we should then consider the first two or three hundred miles a break-in period. All new brakes tend to wear a little at the first and finally settle into their own natural state. At this point, an additional wedge adjustment could be needed. After that, once every thousand or two thousand miles, we should have safe and happy motoring. <laughs>